a group whose flourishing is uh, continues to be helped by the sponsorship of Hewlett Packard and Travel Consulting, for which we're extremely grateful. For those of you who don't know me, my name's Nick Montague. I'm the Chairman of Council at Queen Mary, but I'm also a superannuated Mandarin, which supposedly qualifies me uh, to pontificate initially about tonight's seminar and to chair it. Uh, I'm delighted to be doing so. Having lived through some of the uh, changes in government and governance of recent years, and I think the problem has been that although those changes have been significant, it's always difficult in a country which has an unwritten constitution to know how substantial, how enduring, and in essence, how formal they are. Certainly the relationship between ministers and civil servants has changed in substance for a number of reasons. Certainly also part or one of these reasons has been the emergence under New Labour of much stronger special advisors in many departments with a status that is de facto halfway between that of a junior minister and a civil servant, which has frequently resulted in a diminution of the permanent secretary's role on the policy side. So that the permanent secretary is no longer regarded as automatically the Secretary of State's senior policy advisor. But it's also, I think, been changed by the growth of managerialism, or at least pseudo-managerialism, in the civil service. And I would date this back essentially to Margaret Thatcher and her obsession with Marx and Spencer. Uh, a non-trivial point. Uh, she was heavily influenced by Derek Rayner, the then managing director of Marks and Spencer, who became her advisor on efficiency. And uh, Marks and Spencer became, for the Prime Minister and her advisors, the epitome of the successful organization to which all other organizations, public or private, should aspire. And I think that it is since then that there's been a tacit assumption that running the civil service is like running a business. And tacit it may be, but I also think it's pernicious, because running the civil service is not like running a business for all sorts of reasons. There are things like pay constraints, perverse accounting conventions, and emphasis on yearly expenditure without regard to what lies beyond the year. But also, very significantly for tonight's seminar, businesses are relatively monolithic compared with the numbers of parties involved in the civil service, where you've got departmental civil service, departmental ministers, the treasury, and number 10. One feature of this pseudo-managerialism has been the growth of boards with non-executive directors. And while I think originally non-executive directors were essentially like Vietnamese pot-bellied pigs, a kind of designer accessory without which no department could be seen to be. They've been taken increasingly seriously, and their presence has been enforced from the centre. But, in practice, they have no corporate responsibilities as we would understand it. Essentially, they are informal, paid advisors to the permanent centre, which again is highly relevant to tonight's discussion. Because these developments emphasize the need to look once again at responsibilities and accountabilities. What respectively are ministers and civil servants responsible for? Does the Maxwell Fife doctrine, that ministers are responsible for everything, hold good? Or does the contrast between Jack Straw saying, I take complete responsibility for but then doing absolutely nothing about it. And Sir Thomas Dugdale taking responsibility for the Critchell Down affair and resigning mean that we are in a wholly new world. Certainly there are the golden ages, and I can assure you that John and Mark are not among them, who look back to the days when men were men and ministers took responsibility. But things 
have moved on since then. And in a word, it is time to look again at governance in government, particularly as an attempt by the Treasury a few years ago succeeded only in muddying the waters. And we're lucky tonight to have with us John McCorson and Mark Addison, who have a wealth of experience in government and in the public sector, John in the Treasury and then in the National Gallery, Mark as almost a white ball groupie from number 10 to employment to the Crown Prosecution Service to death, and who have over the last couple of years been devoting a lot of time and a lot of intellectual power uh, to clarifying the relationship between ministers and civil servants and how accountability in governments has evolved. So it's great pleasure to welcome you here this evening. And Mark, I think you're kicking off and then John. Exactly. Nate, thank you very much. Um, and thank you all for inviting us uh, and for coming along. It's the first time I've been to uh, this wonderful place, so it's a particular pleasure for me to be here. And I think the same probably applies to you. Yep, absolutely. Uh, just in terms of mechanics, we're going to talk for about 45 minutes and then about half an hour for questions. And most of that talking time will be John rather than me. And the reason for that is uh, very simple because this work is effectively John's uh, brainchild. And uh, he, has, he, he started it off, I think he's been the engine room. And I have chipped in a few thoughts here and there as we've gone along. Uh, and together we have come up, we hope, with a reasonably convincing analysis of what we think is a significant issue which uh, the civil service and the British government needs to address uh, if it is to improve its performance in a number of respects. Uh, neither of us are experts, um, uh, we think, nor are we academics, but we have between us, uh, as Nick uh, suggested, spent um, six decades uh, either in government or alongside it or close to it, observing what goes on. And uh, our conclusion, our broad conclusion, which, and I'm just going to flash up some of the key points that John's going to cover in <coughs> detail, but our broad conclusion is that there is a chronic lack of clarity and a chronic uh, degree of confusion around the respective responsibilities of permanent secretaries and ministers. Uh, and the same goes for uh, departmental boards and civil service governments more generally. And uh, this, this slide just indicates what we think some of the um, consequences and uh, circumstances of all that are. First of all, uh, we think the structures are not well integrated, articulated, or in many cases understood by the main players. <coughs> we think that boards have no clear remit uh, accountability or relationship to the established powers and duties of the key players. Uh, we think the uh, respective leadership roles of permanent secretaries and ministers are opaque and muddled. And we think that all of that uh, leads to a situation in which um, the operation of government uh, underperforms. We think there is room for significant room for improvement, and if that improvement were to be secured, we think the leadership of departments would improve, and we think the capability of departments would improve, and that capability includes capability in relation to delivery. So we think improvement is possible. Uh, we also think there are some significant risks in not uh, taking steps to improve the current situation, and one of the reasons for that is that these tensions, these underlying tensions and confusions will not go away. Uh, there is a significant risk that if they aren't addressed, they will provoke or some crisis will happen, some uh, emergency steps will be taken to change governance, and it might well end up being worse rather than better. Uh, so our mission, if you like, and we are rather pleased that, uh, at least in recent times, this seems to be getting a bit more airtime, nothing to do with us, I should say, but the Tories have, of course, come up with some proposals for um, changing civil service uh, board governance. And our main concern is to ensure that those changes, whatever changes are made, are grounded in a cool and careful appreciation of the underlying issues, rather than rushed and snatched at with false analogies of the sort that Nick, you described at the outset. Just to flash forward to the end and say which bits of this work we feel uh, confident about and which we feel less confident about. Uh, we feel confident that we have identified a significant 
issue which needs to be addressed. We're confident we have analysed correctly some of the underlying causes uh, of these tensions and uncertainties. We're pretty confident that a large part of the answer lies in clarifying the respective roles and responsibilities <coughs> of ministers uh, and permanent secretaries. We're pretty confident that the answer does not lie, however, in a very clear and sharp separation, uh, a mutually exclusive list of this is the territory of permanent secretaries and this is the territory of ministers. And we're pretty clear that uh, a large part of the answer lies in an acceptance of the notion that permanent secretaries, um, that there should be a presumption that permanent secretaries have the key role in relation to leadership in departments, but that ministers can override it. So we're pretty confident about that bit of the analysis. We're less confident. Um, we, uh, we just flash up at this early point in the, in the discussion. We're less confident that our um, options for governments and boards have yet hit exactly the right spot. Um, we think that we've come up with some useful thoughts to play around with. We don't think we've necessarily identified the best or the only options, uh, and we look forward some discussion around that, perhaps particularly at the end. So that, that's the sketch, uh, and the full painting is about to be displayed uh, by you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, before I do that, I need your help. When I looked at what I was going to say, I saw that I had five kinds of problems to describe, and four kinds of solutions, and every good sermon has only three points. <laughs> so you are each going to have to sleep through two problems and one solution. If you can just handle that, we'll be, we'll be motoring. So the first problem I want to talk about is uh, deracinated boards. Uh, the civil service, in, as they were saying, set up boards as though it would work fine to import the outward form without thinking about what the real substance was. And of course, it doesn't work. If you look at the private sector context, what you see there is that the governance is about balancing management power and shareholder interests. That there's a context of powers and law that is well articulated. And so corporate boards reflect a balance of influence in reaching integrated strategic decisions at the highest level. They have well-developed complex, mature processes of accountability. And all of these, they're designed to bolster the voice of the shareholder, bolster the board's duty to the shareholder interest. That's an interest which is of paramount importance, but which would otherwise be in some danger of getting subordinated to managerial or customer interests. If you look at the charity sector, there's a similar set of points that would apply. And of course, these provisions don't avert all the problems, nor do they solve them, but they do help. And it's all quite different from the central government. There aren't any shareholders. Boards have no accountabilities, unless hazily to the minister. They have no powers. They don't hire or fire the permanent secretary. In fact, if anything, it's the other way around. They aren't necessarily the highest level of integrated decision making. There isn't any clarity about what interests the board must balance, nor about how it relates to the powers and duties of the, the main players. So what that means is, as Nick was saying, that boards have no roots in the roles and powers and accountabilities that actually obtain as a government. And in that context, they are more or less talking shops. And I think in that role they do some good. <coughs> but they are just talking shops. And there's real confusion as to whether they have any responsibility or accountability. We saw a nice plant in the private sector garden, and we uprooted it, and we dropped it on our allotment, <coughs> leaving its roots waving in the air. And it needs to be replanted in the central government soil. It needs to be reported. So the second problem, confused leadership roles. The Administration uh, <coughs> Select Committee recently compared the statements of two very distinguished ex-permanent secretaries. They did not agree who was responsible for running the blocks. <coughs> so Michael Quinlan, 
and very characteristically picked his way carefully, avoiding any possible untruth. But maybe also sidestepping a crucial truth. Sir Nicholas Montague, I don't know him, but you may do, left him and said something rather bold, which captures a crucial truth, but also um, lays itself open to a criticism. <coughs> so there is confusion about the mandate, the leadership mandate in departments. And that doesn't make life any easier. Uh, John Reed once said that his job as Home Secretary was leading the department, not managing it. And to my eye, if he distinguished those two quite so sharply, he can't quite have understood either. So the third problem, instability. The, the opacity of, of governance and of roles leads to widespread incomprehension and therefore instability in the way that Mark was describing. Opposition sit on the sidelines, they watch the apparent confusion, they react to a public which is hungry for more accountability, not least around the delivery of departments. Uh, this happens frequently, it's happened before, and it's happening now again with the, uh, with the Tories. Oppositions tend to want more involvement in civil service management. They want ministerial control of boards, or they want their own non-executives, or other ways to break through a, a, a system that seems unwilling to change its spots. But actually, there is no system or at least none that is well articulated. So changes have to be conceived and implemented in what is pretty well a conceptual void. The changes may be helpful, but if so, sort of by chance. The temptation is to create changes that will strengthen accountability and blame without strengthening responsibility. And that introduces yet more instability. A system that's already weak gets the shakes. For me, though, it's the fourth problem that I really care about the most. That the confusion about responsibility for leading departments has long been a drag on any attempts to improve capability and delivery. For decades, we've heard complaints about leadership and performance management in departments. Complaints that they're not up to effective delivery whether it's making payments to farmers or running IS projects or the professional management of finance. For 20 years, the private finance initiative was sold to us on the basis that the public sector cannot deliver as effectively as the private. Capability reviews more recently have raised concerns about delivery as well. Now, you can argue about how far these complaints are valid. I'm not sure Mark and I completely agree on that point. You can argue whether central government is actually worse than the private sector at delivery. There's no hard evidence either way. My observation is that central government performs worse in these areas than it should. And whatever its performance, its capability remains weak. Delivery, it seems to me, needs professional skills in managing programs, projects, procurement, finance, people, IS. He needs professional pride in exercising those skills. Managers have to respect and foster the skills and their practitioners, even if they don't have them themselves. And the culture must encourage learning from experience. But in central government departments, all too often, the culture gives a too absolute priority to meeting the Im immediate political needs of ministers. And up to a point, that is exactly as it should be. The problem is there are too few checks and balances, too few things that would stop delivery from losing out all along the way, even where it shouldn't. And it's a culture where learning from mistakes is dangerous because you have to start <coughs> acknowledging them. So professional interests are subordinated, professional skills are downplayed, managers have too little experience of using the world. I think many permanent secretaries often don't know what good finance or good HR directors do or indeed are. So if professionals come in from the outside, from the private sector for instance, they're in for a shock, especially finance directors. They find they don't have a role they can understand. Many of them leave in frustration. Yeah, yeah, things do change. Perhaps we set the bar a little bit higher. 
time goes by. But the sector book companies have been very slow. Slower, I would say, even than most of the wider public sector in nurturing professional management skills. After 40 years, we're still hearing the same forlorn calls for more recruitment and delivery experts. And every week sees more reports about failures in management of projects or IS or whatever it might be. And these concerns go back a very long way. Now, what the Fulton Report was all about 40 years ago, and they had been there 50 years before that. William Rari, who was a senior civil servant, <coughs> well, a million civil servant at the time of the Fulton Report, saw an underlying issue here. He thought that the below the issues of delivery and of management, there lurked the question of the role of the civil service in its relationship to ministers. And I think he was right. How, given comprehensive ministerial accountability, can civil servants have adequate accountability <coughs> for leading their organizations? How can they be adequately responsible for capable delivery? It's a difficult issue and governments have persistently refused to rethink it. I think we are about to have an example of a refusal vintage 1966. In a few minutes, I'll mention a refusal vintage 1980s, in much the same style. So the fifth problem, this confusion brings serious costs, and to ministers as well as to their departments. Ministerial accountability is comprehensive, and it's 24-7, and it can be lethal to their careers. And it is, of course, precisely the failure of delivery or professional management these days that's most likely to lead to scandals. The traditional doctrine has that ministers are always liable to carry the can. Their opponents will try to enforce that wherever they can. In practice, sometimes ministers do carry the can, and sometimes they don't, as in these examples. But the argument is often messy and often dangerous. So the obvious response for governments is to try to separate who is responsible for what, make a clear and definite separation. And the Derek Lewis story of the 1997, uh, 1996 story there, was all about an attempt to make a definite separation between policy, which was for ministers, and operations, which was the civil servants. And it failed. And a parliamentary committee in 1997 confirmed that in their, their view it could not be done. But 10 years later, when foreign prisoners were released when they should have been deported, the Home Office had another go at such a definite, absolute separation in what they called their compact. I think these separations have never worked, and I think they're doomed. To make progress, we have to start from a bit further back. We have to face up to that underlying tension, which is also at the heart of the government's issue. It's a tension that stems from the traditional doctrine that ministers remain accountable for virtually everything and so ultimately responsible for everything we do. The doctrine came into focus uh, a century or so ago. It the landscape was already shifting around it when it first came into focus. It has real constitutional strength, but it's a bit too simple. It leaves civil servants as lifeless extensions of the minister, mere prostheses. And it leaves departments as insubstantial wraiths, existing only at ministers' pleasure. The actual role of civil servants was changing, but the doctrine did not. After openness and select committees and freedom of information, civil servants could not possibly be called simply confidential advisors, and that word was quietly retired. But the changes have gone deeper than that. Most civil servants aren't any longer clustered around ministers as their advisors. They've come increasingly to carry their own responsibilities, especially as governments got bigger, with remoter links from ministers to the fringes. Most civil servants are now part of large agencies and are responsible for complex services. Most of them serve the public directly and never see a minister. And some areas, just to remind ourselves, have been quite deliberately put beyond political and ministerial control. Ministers may remain accountable in Parliament for them, but they are not responsible for their decisions. 
and all civil servants. Now we are clear about this. All civil servants have duties <coughs> that are not to ministers. For instance, to the values in the civil service code, or the duty of the permanent secretary to uh, value for money, to record an instruction <coughs> from the minister if it clashes with value for money considerations. So 20 years ago, next steps agencies were developed to reflect these sorts of changes. And in 1986, the next steps team proposed a review of how the evident responsibilities of civil servants coexist with comprehensive ministerial accountability. The next, step, next steps team was put back in its box. A review, it was said, might jeopardize democratic accountability, always the killer argument against rethinking this issue. Forgive me if, for a second, I foolishly ride a hobby horse down this stretch of the main road. It's sort of a digression, but not quite. In the 1980s, the relationship between ministers and civil servants had become a very hot issue because of Clive Ponting and the Dog Grano, because of Spy Catcher, because of Westland, etc. Those in charge chose, understandably, to take a rather absolutist line. The civil service was there for all practical purposes to serve only the government of the day as represented by ministers. Of course, when the chips are done, civil servants do and must do what the government of the day tells them or they resign. But the simplicity, the absolutism of this doctrine, the Armstrong formulation, which still seduces people, as far as I can see, is unhelpful. A prime loyalty is crucially different from a sole loyalty. Civil servants also have duties under the civil service code and to the departments they work for, and these, these duties stand in a rather complex relationship to their <coughs> prime loyalty. The Armstrong Doctrine allows the civil service and its forms of organisation no real substance. So we should say instead that the role of the permanent civil service is to serve not just the government of the day, but the succession of governments of the day. It's a small adjustment. It's still consistent with comprehensive ministerial accountability. It still affirms the prime loyalty of the civil service to the government of the day. But it allows for non-ministerial departments, for all other forms of civil service organization that persist when governments change. And so through this small chink in the absolutist doctrine, all the great departments of state can pass, blinking, as it were, into the light of day as long-term institutions needing long-term leadership in the interests of long-term capability. But I'm going to throw that problem aside now and return to the model about accountability and responsibility, which can, I think, be clarified somewhat. We should distinguish who is responsible, that is, who should see that something gets done, either doing it themselves or taking management action to get it done, from who accounts for or explains what is done, to whom and how. The first is responsibility, the second is accountability. You don't need to use the words that way. Use the words as you like. What I'm trying to identify is the underlying, is some underlying concepts which are important and useful. So yes, of course, democratic accountability should not be up for grabs. But let's not let it dictate wholly the nature of responsibilities. <coughs> People often say accountability for something entails responsibility for it, and that entails the power to take decisions. Governments have said it frequently. But on that basis, if ministers have comprehensive accountability, they have accountability for everything, then all decisions alike are equally within their role. And as we've seen, that just isn't right. There are decisions which ministers don't take, or may not take. And that isn't really a surprise, no, and nor is it a surprise that in the civil service, as in any management chain, responsibilities nest and coexist and overlap. You can have responsibilities that are in the first instance you can have responsibilities that are delegated, you can have responsibilities that are presumptive, responsibilities that are ultimate. 
and there's an infinite range of such possibilities. We don't need to be too simplistic about this. So now, we're ready to move forward on governance. First of all, saying what, it's, what it is, what it's for, and what it should look like. Governance is there to guide, lead, challenge, and support an organization in the long-term <coughs> interests of those that the organization is there to serve. It comprises a mix of responsibilities, accountabilities, structures, processes, information flows, duties, and powers. And it's largely about managing and balancing key tensions to give integrated decisions at the highest level. In our case, in the central government case, balancing comprehensive ministerial accountability with civil servants' responsibility for leadership and capability. And balanced decision-making at the highest level means that you need to integrate potentially conflicting requirements. For instance, the potentially conflicting requirements of strategy, or policy, or resource allocation, delivery, <coughs> long-term capability, management. It also needs balance and consistency in, in drawing on varied perspectives, different experiences, different voices, including non-executive. And balance is not compromise or not fudge, don't get me wrong. To keep your balance when you're accelerating or facing a high wind, you lean over a long way. So the elements of governance are highly interdependent and they're very sensitive to context and they should be rooted in the roles and accountabilities that are fundamental to the sector. And that's, what it, that's why it's such a delicate matter to make changes. So as Mark said, we propose one step we think relatively straightforward and then there are three that we're not so sure about. <coughs> but they all hang on these um, principles of governance design which um, we think are neglected in central government. We think they need your support. So the first step is to affirm the respective roles of the key actors. The minister, of course, has comprehensive individual accountability to parliament and the prime minister, and wide powers to dictate almost any decision within the department. But limited interest, limited time, a limited length of stay in post, limited capacity to take responsibility, especially for management issues, and not unlimited powers to take decisions either. <coughs> the permanent secretary, on the other hand, is the accounting officer and permanent head of an executive whose role is to support the succession of governments of the day with responsibility for organisational leadership, management, performance and capability. So broadly speaking, while strategic policy leadership falls to ministers, permanent secretaries should be seen as having a largely presumptive responsibility for long-term <coughs> organisational leadership. These responsibilities are presumptive in that in most areas they obtain unless the minister overrides them. They're largely presumptive because there are some areas where ministers cannot override them. In any case, ministers don't normally want to play a large role in managing the department, and the expectation has grown up that their right to do so is exercised by <coughs> exception. This is not the absolute separation of functions that, the government, that governments keep failing to make sense of. It's more attuned to reality than that absolute separation. It reflects what happens now. So the straightforward step we propose is to articulate, to affirm these responsibilities and powers, to set out which sorts of issues under current law and conventions fall within which categories of handling as far as the ministerial override is concerned. What sort of processes the minister and the firm <coughs> need to go through in each case. This would avoid all that haziness, all that opacity, all that muddle in leadership. It would empower permanent secretaries, as far as leadership is concerned, and it would give a means of holding them to account more clearly, and it would clarify the limitations on the decision-making powers of ministers. 
We don't say that. It's not an innovation. It's just a clarification. But we would propose a modest innovation too. But if the minister does insist on a decision in these areas that presumptively fall to the permanent secretary, the permanent secretary should be able to document the insistence and the objections to it. And of course, under freedom of information, that document might easily get released to the public. And that will deter a casual or unreasonable insistence by a minister. And it would encourage ministers and permanent secretaries to, to uh, hammer out a way to meet both the minister's needs and the needs of long-term leadership and capability. That's the proposal we feel fairly confident about. Beyond that, it becomes more difficult to pitch proposals for change at just the right level. But we've gone for three relatively particular changes to spark debate. The Minister will hold the Permanent Secretary to account within the Department for those presumptive responsibilities, and the Permanent Secretary is already accountable informally to the Cabinet Secretary for capability re the review results. But we could develop uh, and strengthen that line of external accountability so that it runs from the Permanent Secretary to a new civil service board chaired from the centre of government. That new civil service board could build on existing structures, the um, civil service steering board, the Permanent Secretary's management group. It would probably be chaired by the Cabinet <coughs> Secretary. It could have on it representatives of number 10 and the Treasury and the main professionals, as well as non-executives. And we could give it a voice in the contracts, the management contracts of permanent secretaries. That line of accountability wouldn't detract from ministers' comprehensive accountability. It wouldn't detract from their right and their power to take decisions in almost every area of departmental activity. But permanent secretaries would be more empowered by it to take responsibility for leadership and capability, and better motivated as well. And departments might be better able to balance and integrate political imperatives with the interests of long-term capability. And the centre might be better able to coordinate the work of departments, including towards cross-cutting aims. So those are two recommendations about permanent secretaries, affirming their presumptive responsibility, strengthening a line of external accountability. But you could focus both that responsibility and that accountability on the departmental board. That would do more to bring a collective <coughs> capability and outside experience into departmental decision making. It would also sharpen up what is at the moment the fuzzy role of departmental boards. So the board could be responsible for preparing integrated decisions, decisions that reconcile ministerial requirements on strategic policy so far as possible with the interests of long-term capability. And the board would therefore have a role beyond being a talking shop, beyond being an advisory council or support mechanism for the permanent secretary. Going further, the departmental board could be accountable to the Central Civil Service Board, not just for departmental capability and performance, but also for the delivery of cross-cutting policy. That accountability would of course need to be underpinned by collective ministerial support if you weren't going to get the collective and disease, sorry, political and bureaucratic channels uh, in a tangle. And if you wanted, the non-executives on the departmental board could play a role in recommending to the cabinet secretary a change in the permanent secretary as the Tories have suggested. A proposal that could make sense, it seems to me, but not in isolation as they've left it, only in the context of a balanced set of governance powers and responsibilities that made sense overall. So pinning this responsibility and this accountability on the board would bolster its authority in discharging them. It would equip the system to deal better with failures, and it would, to some extent, bring central government boards in line with the private sector. Company and charity boards 
are in any case beholden <coughs> to their customers, um, their donors, in any case. Um, and what the formal process of accountability of government does is to safeguard the interests of shareholders, in one case, beneficiaries, in the other. And for central government, this would have a similar sort of effect. Because the constitutional position of the minister, the power of the prime minister, the minister's accountability to parliament, all mean that the department is going to be beholden to the minister anyway. Nothing's going to change that. But the government's regime would also help to safeguard the interests of the succession of governments. So changes of the sort we've suggested to boards would raise really quite difficult questions about the structure of boards and departments. And there are several options here. And to be frank with you, I'm not quite confident that any of them seem clearly right yet. I think more thought is needed. <coughs> the simplest option is for the permanent secretary or a non-executive to chair a management board. Management boards is roughly what we have in most departments now, and the permanent secretary normally chairs them. These boards operate subject to a ministerial power of override, and they would continue to do so. So these boards feed into, but are not, the highest level of decision making. The model whose logic would most easily be recognised in other sectors would be a single, integrated, senior departmental board chaired by the minister. That would be the highest level of decision making. But imposing it in all cases would cut across the position of ministers. How many ministers would really devote the time to chairing a board of that sort with those comprehensive and rather deep responsibilities? Could a board of that kind realistically be accountable anywhere except to the Prime Minister and Parliament? Surely not. Nor would every minister be in post long enough to ensure that leadership is consistent. <coughs> I don't think, on the other hand, it would be acceptable to the minister for the permanent secretary or an, or a non-executive to chair a board which really had those high <coughs> responsibilities, at least not always. So a third option, which some people favour, would be to establish two boards at the top of the department, one surrounding the minister, the departmental board, and the other the Permanent Secretary, the Management Board. Now, hard separation between policy and operations can't be made, absolutely, I am convinced, in any area, least of all in all those areas that have not already been converted into agencies. So the Departmental Board, the Senior Board, must keep a comprehensive responsibility, even if it <coughs> delegates certain areas to the Management Board. If it keeps that responsibility, it must keep the corresponding capacity to discharge that responsibility in an integrated way. So the departmental board would be the senior tier of decision making in the department. It would be responsible for taking decisions that integrate strategic policy issues with those of departmental leadership. And it would have to take account of the management board's views in areas that touch on the management board's responsibility or accountability. The management board would be um, the board that was, was responsible for all those areas that I said presumptively fall to the permanent secretary. This is a this two board structure is complex, but it's complex because it does reflect the inherently dual leadership of departments, in which the senior voice, the minister is not normally deeply concerned with long-term management issues. So it turns what is at the moment a balance between two individuals, the Minister and the Permanent Secretary, into a balance between two boards. So in that sense, it's a conservative approach. But it might not reflect the way in which every minister wants to work. Not every minister would want, as it were, to put his responsibility into commission to make it the responsibility of a board. And it's not obvious that we should force ministers to do so. And splitting responsibilities between two boards risks building in divergent and one-sided decision-making rather than integrated decision-making. In the worst case, it could, far from managing the conflicts in, in an organisation, it could actually reinforce them. 
and it may leave leadership and capability as second-class citizens in the way they too often are at the moment anyway. So it's very, this two-board structure is very different from the structure that would be preferred in the corporate or the charity sector, and preferred in those two sectors for good reason. But there are two safeguards that we could uh, introduce to do something about uh, those two risks. And I've put those safeguards, two possible safeguards, up on that slide. To conclude, in central government, the dual leadership of departments in ministers and firms <coughs> is fundamental. And you can't wish it away. But it has serious implications for long-term capability. And governance structures do matter to long-term performance. And so they should be got right and they should be thought through. They need to be sensitive to the context. They need to be rooted in the fundamental roles and accountabilities that obtain in that context. And simply importing private sector governance structures into a different context has left them pretty well meaningless. <coughs> but you can make improvements, and there are prizes to be gained, and so we think that we should affirm the presumptive responsibilities of permanent secretaries for performance and leadership and capability and clarify them and articulate them in what might become a code. Uh, we should also develop the accountability of permanent secretaries in those areas, possibly to a new central civil service board. <coughs> and then there are several options for departmental boards. You could stick with the status quo. You could say these boards are inherently advisory support mechanisms of permanent secretary to workshops. <coughs> Let's simply be clear that that's what they are. Or you could develop collective board accountability, for instance, to a central civil service board, so that boards could then also take on the presumptive responsibility alongside the permanent secretary. That, though, raises those questions about the structure of boards. And you could have um, just a management board around the permanent secretary, a single integrated departmental board around the minister, or you can have two boards. The choice is not wholly straightforward. So we've made these particular proposals, but we recognise, as Mark said, that it might be wiser in practice to pitch real proposals at a slightly higher level of principle, leaving departments to design their own structures so that they would be uh, required to comply with the principles or explain, importing again the private sector uh, uh, principle of comply or explain. Uh, it would be wise also, we think, to start with a full debate on the range of possibilities and to look at each of these different sets of proposals in several different contexts. You need to look at them in the context of the framework of performance management for departments, which is changing quite fast, on which I think uh, the central government has thoughts, on which the Conservative Party has thoughts. You need to look at them in the context of the delicate balance of powers and relationships between ministers, civil servants, permanent secretary, finance director, the board. And you need to look at it Look at them also in the context of the balance between the centre of government and the departments, a much, a much under-analysed area which has crucial importance here, and also bedevils the private sector analogy, because people always insist on thinking of the uh, group structure and the divisional structure, which is not what we have at the moment in central government. We're dealing here with a complex, a delicate habitat. And in my, if I may say so, in a compass which seems to be full of engineering, it's not a machine, it's more like a garden. And we need to treat it more horticulturally, more organically, in a more evolutionary way. It would be good to see governments evolving through iterative stages of analysis, consultation, codification, practical experience, evaluation, 
and then feeding around the cycle all over again, which is what has happened in the private sector with the uh, combined code. And the difficulty is this will take intellectual effort and broad consultation and sustained attention, all the things that are very difficult for governments to apply in this area, all the things that went into the combined code and went into the evolution of the charity of the government as well. But I think central government deserves no less, and I think it would be an awful pity if what it got was just another half-baked fix, just another politically motivated lurch. So I hope we'll get that. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed for that. I suspect there will be loads of questions and comments. I'm going to exercise the chair's prerogative and ask the first one, uh, which is...